Okay, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to our one o'clock press briefing, listening to a quieter ocean in the pandemic to track impacts on marine life. I'm Lauren Lipuma from the AGU Media Relations Office and I'll be moderating today. So just some quick housekeeping items. So the slides from this presentation will be uploaded to the Fall Meeting and Media Center, and the link is there um, on this slide. And also my colleague, Liza Lester, will put that in the chat box as well. A recording of this event will also be posted to AGU's YouTube channel later today, and um, it will be under the playlist Fall Meeting 2020 Press Conferences. So you can share that with friends and colleagues or watch it later at your own pleasure. And then also a reminder, after the formal Q&A portion of the briefing ends, we will open up a 30 minute informal discussion room via Zoom so that reporters can have an additional opportunity to chat with the panelists one on one. And my colleague Liza will post a link to that discussion room in this chat box. And the passcode will be AGU press all lowercase. And if you have any questions at any time during this briefing, please email us at news at agu.org. We'll get to your question um, as soon as we can. So we'll start off with the panelists giving some brief presentations and then we'll go into Q&A. We'll end after 45 minutes or when there are no more questions, whichever comes first. So our panelists today are Jason Gadamke, Chris Gabriel, Bob Ziak, Anna Sherovich, and Leela Hatch. And so now I will turn it over to Jason for the first presentation. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Gadamke. I'm a marine scientist with NOAA Fisheries, and I'm pleased to join my colleagues today in briefing you about underwater sound, human-produced noise, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, we're all currently living in a world dominated by the pandemic, which has led to 2020 being a difficult and unpredictable year for everyone across the board. But despite the extreme challenges of COVID, as a scientist, the economic slowdown has actually provided an extremely rare opportunity to study how large scale decreases in human activities impact ocean noise levels. It has also dramatically highlighted the essential nature of developing long term and ongoing ocean observation systems like those you'll hear about today. These systems allow us to study the implications of events uh, like the pandemic at scales that matter to both marine animals and marine industries. But before we go too far, I want to provide a bit of an introduction for these talks and address what makes sound unique in the ocean and so important for marine life and how human activities have impacted the underwater acoustic environment or soundscape. Uh, next slide, please. So to start, the ocean is primarily a world enveloped in darkness. Light is filtered from the water within a few hundred meters, limiting the ability to see. Sound, however, travels exceptionally well. To illustrate this, I'll briefly describe the Heard Island Feasibility Test, an experiment conducted in the early 1990s to test the ability of low frequency acoustic signals to travel great distances. The researchers deployed a series of underwater speakers in the Southern Ocean, north of Antarctica that you can see here. At the same time, listening stations were placed around the world's oceans many thousands of miles away. Uh, go ahead and advance to animate the slide, please. Strikingly, three hours after the researchers began, began transmitting test signals, they were picked up from receivers on the opposite side of the earth, on the order of 15 to 20,000 kilometers away. While it was an incredibly complex experiment, it simply and beautifully illustrated that sound literally has the ability to travel halfway around the world and beyond. Next slide, please. Because sound travels so well, the ocean has always been a noisy place. There are many natural physical and biological sources like storms, earthquakes, and a wide range of animals that produce sound. For millions of years, marine life has used sound as a primary means to communicate with other individuals, as well as to sense and learn about the ocean environment. They use it to find food and mates, avoid predators, and navigate among many other essential life functions. Sound is critical to the survival of a great many species. Next slide, please. But with the rise of the industrial age over just the last one to 200 years, which is really almost instantaneous on an evolutionary time scale, levels of underwater noise from human activities have increased dramatically. This includes propeller noise from large vessel traffic, seismic survey shots from oil and gas exploration, and other industrial developments, all contributing to changing ocean soundscapes. Next slide, please. Because of concerns about the potential impacts of noise on marine life, a few years ago, NOAA initiated an effort, the Ocean Noise Strategy, 
to guide our agency toward a more comprehensive and effective management of the effects of man-made noise. A strategy roadmap pictured here was released in 2016, which summarizes the current state of knowledge and includes steps to improve what we know about underwater noise and how we can work to minimize adverse effects of ocean noise on marine species and habitats. As part of the Ocean Noise Strategy, NOAA also initiated a flagship project called the Ocean Noise Reference Station Network, run out of Bob Ziak's Acoustic Lab, as part of a collaboration across NOAA offices and with the National Park Service. As pictured here, it consists of a series of sound recording stations collecting long-term acoustic data sets in all major regions of U.S. waters. Bob will be touching on the Noise Reference Station Network in his talk, and Leela Hatch will be discussing another noise uh, strategy flagship project called Sank Sound. Next slide, please. Now, when the glo global scale of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic became apparent early this year, it was clear that this presented a nearly unprecedented opportunity to, to see how reductions in human activities could impact ocean sound soundscapes on a global scale. We led an interagency effort to inventory all long-term passive acoustic recording sites funded by the US government that could be used in studies of ocean sound impacts from COVID-19. These are pictured on the map here with vessel traffic and fishing, uh, fishing activity also overlaid. Finally, we are also working with our international colleagues to ensure these US systems can be used as part of a global effort to characterize the pandemic's impact on ocean soundscapes. You'll be hearing about a number of these acoustic systems and observations from each of our panelists today. I'd like to emphasize that any data or figures we show uh, are all preliminary at this stage. It will take scientists time to assess all the data we've collected in 2020 and beyond. But it is our hope to share with you what we have observed, what we find interesting, and what deserves further study. With all that said, I'd now like to turn it over to our next speaker, Chris Gabriel with the Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve. Thanks, Jason, and hello, everyone. As he said, uh, my name is Chris Gabriel, and for the past 30 years, I've had the honor of leading a humpback whale population study in Glacier Bay. And for 20 of those years, we were doing underwater sound monitoring as well, so that we could understand how whales communicate using underwater sound. Uh, to do that, we describe what makes noise, what it sounds like, and how often it occurs. Now we do this work because national parks have a pretty simple but also difficult mission. On the one hand, we preserve natural and cultural resources while making, but we also make parks available to the, to the public. And sometimes that can be a bit of a balancing act, but science has a very important role in achieving that balance. So um, next slide, please, sorry. Yeah, that was where we're, sorry. <laughs> um, so prior to the pandemic, Glacier Bay hosted over 600,000 park visitors per year, most of those on cruise ships. And 2020 presented a unique opportunity because the cruise ships and tour boats were absence, absent. We were able to take this, uh, able and lucky actually, to take this once in a lifetime opportunity to study whale communication in natu natural quiet. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah, there we go. So since 2020, we've been listening uh, with a hydrophone in the mouth of Glacier Bay. And in 2019 and 2020, we added a sound trap hydrophone up in the middle of the bay. Now the main sources of sound in the summer are wind, rain, harbor seals, vessels, and whales, pretty much in uh, descending order of how often they occur. And by the way, this year, there was still a little bit of vessel traffic, mostly private yachts, uh, uh, sport fishing, and also park service vessels. And just a small note to say that um, almost anywhere in the ocean that you would put a hydrophone in the water, you will hear vessel noise. And on a regional or a global scale, Glacier Bay is actually not particularly noisy, but it is a place that was set aside for science where we can study and try to manage the effects of vessel noise. Next slide, please. So it's important to remember that uh, whales evolved over millions of years in a quiet ocean. And as Jason mentioned, they use the sound environment in all aspects of their daily life. And it's only been in the last couple hundred years that they've had to contend with vessel noise uh, from ships and boats. Uh, most people are aware of the famous humpback whale song, which is a, the male's loud and complex uh, sound that they make during mating season. But in their feeding grounds, humpback whales actually make fairly quiet, short, simple calls. 
and these calls are very easily overwhelmed by vessel noise. In previous work, we measured the loudness of both the humpback whale calls and a number of different types of vessels, and we use that to make the simulation, which you're seeing on the maps on the slide here. So on the, on the, left, on the left panel is a simulation showing a, a group of uh, distributed humpback whales in, uh, in vocalizing in Glacier Bay. Each one has a little sound footprint around them. That means kind of the distance over which you would expect their sounds to, to travel. On the map on the right, we overlaid the vessel noise that would be typical in a, on a summer day in Glacier Bay. And as you can see, the whales are also on that panel, but you can no longer see them. So the, their sounds are basically overshadowed by the vessel noise. So how do whales cope? Um, well, think about the things that you or I would do if we were trying to communicate in a noisy environment. We would probably talk louder. We would keep our, our words pretty simple. We might have to repeat ourselves and we might also wait for a quieter time to communicate. And whales seem to do some of these same things, but we would like to understand more about that. Next slide, please. So how was 2020 different? Well, data analysis is still in progress, but in a nutshell, the median daily sound levels from a two week period in 2019 versus 2020, uh, in the, the levels in 2020 were about 50% quieter than they were in 2019. And as for what the whales were doing, they seem to be taking up much of the space that was made available by the decreased human activity. By that, I mean, uh, we saw them out in the middle of the channels, taking naps, socializing, feeding with others. Uh, and um, also on the hydrophone, I heard a lot of long exchanges between whales, including what I think may have been a mother and calf. So uh, it's like this horrible pandemic uh, confined us humans into really small spaces, but gave the whales back a lot of room to roam, both physically and acoustically. Um, by the way, hump, humpback, Alaska humpbacks have been going through some really rough times since the 2014 through 2016 marine heat wave. So it was really great this summer to be able to see a number of cow-calf pairs. So the next question we'll be working on is whether the whales communicated differently in this quiet period versus other conditions. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to close with some thoughts on why listening matters. On a practical level, we are doing this work to balance between resource protection and human activity in a national park. I like to think that every Glacier Bay visitor becomes one more advocate for protecting our oceans and wild places, because these special places don't stay special without people who care about them. So the visitors are an important part of the ecosystem, so to speak. Um, we all know that the pandemic made us find new ways to do things and it gave us plenty of time to think about what's important. I hope that the work that uh, myself and my fellow, fellow panelists are doing will help us acknowledge human noise and inspire us to learn new ways to uh, decrease our footprint. And in closing, I must mention that collaboration has been absolutely essential to this work. We work with partners at the US Navy and Cornell and other universities as well as the cruise lines and tour vessels that make their vessels available for calibrated signatures. So thanks very much for your attention. And I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Bob Ziak. Thank you, Chris. Um, hello, I'm Bob and I'm an oceanographer from NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our studies of underwater noise off the coast of the Pacific Northwest and how it may have decreased during the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So as you've heard from our previous speakers, sound is one of the most powerful tools for understanding change in the ocean. And to help us understand better the processes that drive changes in ocean sound, in 2014, NOAA and the National Park Service created the Ocean Noise Reference Network, which is a unique array of 12 hydrophones deployed across the entire US coastline. We use data from this network to compare soundscapes across US waters and assess long-term trends and changes in underwater sound. Moreover, the six years of data we have so far from the noise network provides a baseline to compare to the ocean sound level changes observed during the pandemic. Now it's thought that noise levels have been increasing in the world's oceans over the last few decades because of increased global container ship traffic worldwide. However, there is mounting evidence that the ocean has been less noisy over the last year during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is likely because container ship traffic has decreased as global economies have slowed. Next slide, please. So to see whether ocean noise has decreased, 
we analyzed sound levels off the Pacific Northwest, where there are large numbers of ships going to the ports of Vancouver and Seattle. The red dots in this map show the locations of the hydrophone sensors we have in the area, which covers the coast of Washington State and British Columbia, as well as the Puget Sound. Next slide, please. Now this map is the same region as the previous slide, but now shows the container ship traffic in the area. The yellow and red colors highlight the, the high density of ship traffic, which is typically on the order of tens of thousands of ships per year. Now, however, during the spring of 2020, total ship counts in this region declined by roughly 22% as compared to previous years. And our studies of the hydrophone data here show that ocean noise levels also decreased by roughly 30% during the same time period. Thus, the decrease in sound levels observed is consistent with the decline in total number of ships during spring of 2020. Next slide, please. Therefore, to summarize, there is evidence that the economic impacts of the pandemic resulted in decreased ship noise in deep ocean off the Pacific Northwest and the inland waters of the Puget Sound. Furthermore, ocean sound scientists from around the world are collaborating now on this research to investigate how other regions may have become less noisy during the pandemic. And lastly, this research shows that the collection of year-to-year -year baseline data is invaluable for assessing potential impacts of human-generated noise on marine animals and ecosystems to help inform policy. Thank you. Now I'd like to hand it off to our next speaker, Anna Servich. Thanks, Bob. So my name is Anna Shirovich, and I am an associate professor at Texas A&M University at Galveston. And I want to bring your attention today to some other human-made sounds that are not ships, but that also impact marine life, both in the US and globally. Next slide, please. I live on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. And to me, one of the striking features of that large body of water is how the industrialization there extends beyond the shore and into the sea. The first time I ever flew over the Gulf at night, I was amazed it was entirely lit up. It was a sea of oil platforms that you could see. And I think the satellite image of that northern part of the Gulf shows very nicely just how much human activity there is in the water. Each little light that you see here that extends offshore is an oil rig or a ship. And so in addition to light, what that human activity does, it, it also introduces sound to the ocean. So in addition to ships, boats, oil platforms, in the Gulf, that sound includes uh, the sound of air guns from seismic surveys, which are used to find oil and gas deposits below the ocean floor. Play the clip, please. Can you play the clip, please? Um, what I was hoping for you to hear is the sound of air guns that are being fired repeatedly. I don't hear it playing now. But air guns are very intense sounds that are played uh, or that occur over days or weeks during surveys as they cover different patches of the seafloor. They're very prevalent in the Gulf. They're very loud. And the ones that I was going to play for you were recorded from distance of several hundred kilometers. And But as Jason illustrated earlier, this sound can travel really well across the whole basin and can be heard by anyone or anything that is listening underwater. Next slide, please. Anna, can you hear the sounds now? I still don't. Um... Okay, we'll try with the next one. Okay. So in addition to all that human activity, we also have this in the Gulf of Mexico. So the picture here is the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. And this is the northernmost coral reef in the Gulf of Mexico that is protected. There is an estimated 300 species of fish and over 20 species of coral in the sanctuary. And we know that a lot of species that live there produce sounds. So let's try this clip, please. All right, so that, that worked for me. Uh, so this, this is an example of, from flower garden banks where you could hear shrimp snapping and fish kind of crackling and buzzing in the background. Marine animals use sound to catch prey, to detract predators, to find mates. And so you can imagine that human introduced sounds, if they obscure these animal mate sounds, 
can have the potential to affect these species substantially. Lila will tell you more about efforts to record sounds in national marine sanctuaries, but I want to highlight that the understanding uh, that we're still trying to gain is both what are the importance of the sounds that marine animals produce to them, and also how the animals respond to changes in their acoustic environment uh, as it happens over time. Next slide, please. But seismic exploration is not a problem that's unique to the Gulf of Mexico. I have collected underwater recordings of seismic air guns in many locations. Some of them might be surprising. They're remote spots, such as the Southern Ocean off Antarctica, uh, off Bermuda in the middle of the Atlantic, but also some busy areas, such as the Adriatic Sea in the Northeastern Mediterranean. And with these uh, sounds that I wasn't really able to play for you earlier, they really sound like just underwater explosion, this large booming sounds. Next slide, please. And they're repeated regularly uh, for every 10 seconds or so. But so recently with Croatian colleagues, we recorded a couple of seismic surveys that were conducted off the coast of Montenegro in Southern Adriatic pictured here. While the survey was fully contained in Montenegrin waters, which is the area that I illustrated with the red rectangle here, the sound from that survey traveled across the whole ba basin. Advance please. And so, and potentially even went beyond the basin but it was audible and potentially affected marine life in waters in the neighboring countries as well, such as Croatia, Italy, Albania, Greece, and beyond. I'm presenting more detailed results of this research tomorrow at the meeting of the Acoustical Society of America. But the point that I wanted to make here is that dealing with the impacts of noise on marine life often requires looking beyond one's territorial waters. Sound can and does travel beyond the immediate area where it was produced and does not know international borders, but often mitigation and assessment of impact stops at those borders. So going forward, it will be important for countries, especially neighboring countries, to develop frameworks under which they can appropriately respond to low frequency sound threats to marine life. So with that thought, I will hand it off to Lila. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm Leela Hatch. I work for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, uh, which is co-leading a project with the U.S. Navy to measure underwater sound in U.S. National Marine Sanctuaries around the country. If you advance the slide. The project is recording at 30 locations within eight of the protected areas uh, in the Pacific Islands, on the East Coast, and on the West Coast. And because we've developed methods to make comparable measurements over time at this scale, we are in the unexpected position to study the sound level changes before, during, and after this extraordinary year of COVID-19. So the theme um, for what we'll, we're hearing uh, so far in these studies offshore around the country will sound familiar to all of you, I think, as we're finding that we're all experiencing the pandemic, uh, but we're often experiencing it in differently depending on where we live. And those differences can be heard offshore. And I wanna give you an example of what those differences can look like and why they make it both complicated and interesting to try to figure out what is being experienced by wildlife. I'm going to highlight some initial work that we're doing in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Central California and in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which is off the coast of Massachusetts. And both, like Glacier Bay, are important to humpback whales as both feeding and nursery areas. Advanced slide. John Ryan at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is giving a talk tomorrow also at the Acoustical Society of America. And he's made some advanced material, materials publicly available, which we have a link to. Um, we've collaborated with him because of a deep water mooring in the middle of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary where that star is, that has shown a very strong drop in noise levels in the spring and early summer of 2020 relative to past years that directly correlates with very la large scale um, region wide changes in large commercial shipping traffic going up and down the coast of California, which has also decreased over that time period. So again, um, that that's really important work that's that's echoing a lot of the things that Bob was talking about in deep water environments in several places that are dominated by commercial traffic. Looking over now onto the East Coast, 
in Stellwagen, we've begun to compare several measurements. We've been looking at levels of sound, uh, comparing them to past years, and then also looking at the number of vessels that we are detecting acoustically, that we can hear uniquely passing our recorder, and the number of vessels that are tracked by a US Coast Guard operated tracking system. That's a line of sight tracking system. So looking at the comparability of all of those things, if you advance. And what we're finding is drops in all three. So between uh, from 2020 to 20, uh, 2019 to 2020, um, comparing all those attributes, we're seeing a decrease in low frequency sound levels, a decrease in the percent of the day that's dominated by these vessels, these unique vessel signatures acoustically. And we're also seeing a drop in the number of vessels that were tracked using AIS. Advance the slide one more time. What I wanted to show you about this one little period at the beginning of the summer in Massachusetts um, is just um, the difference between those two windows when you look spatially at what that traffic looked like. Those are the tracks of ships in the listening range of the hydrophone in the center, off, and Boston is in sort of the armpit of that coastline. And I think the, 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 the take-home message I just wanted you to have is that you have to squint to see the difference. That's still a lot of human activity. That's not a null that people might feel about the pandemic. What it really is, is different. It's differently distributed. It's different types of vessels. Um, and in fact, it's, it's decreases in the vessels coming in and out of the port of Boston. It's even small increases in the amount of uh, traffic, uh, pleasure and, and fishing and even um, sailing, uh, sailing vessels. So, what does that constellation change in traffic, decreases, but also just differences mean to wildlife? Next slide. We're working with a large team of collaborators to try to get at some of these questions in Monterey Bay and Stellwagen. In Monterey Bay, the California Coastal Alliance and in Stellwagen Bank, the Center for Coastal Studies are taking samples, biopsy samples from humpback whales in the spring and in the fall of this year and next to get a look at the stress hormones um, in these whales and see whether these differences in the chronic background noise levels of these environments in 2020 can have, are, are having an effect and we can detect a change in the physiology of these animals. Uh, we're also looking at changes in vocalization patterns, much like what Chris is doing in Glacier Bay. Uh, advanced slide. So um, these, these, the studies that uh, we're doing here, this team of collaborators I just spoke about, as well as all the folks on this panel, are really helping make direct connections between human activity and our footprint offshore. And that is really important to working internationally and nationally on uh, ways to promote the quieting of vessels. As we work to design quieter vessels, uh, having information about um, how these relationships uh, exist um, between our patterns and what animals experience in places that matter to these animals is a really important part of the puzzle for our dialogue with industries. I think during the pandemic, people are both um, enlightened about some of these other aspects of our environmental footprint that we might not have known as much about before, like acoustics, but maybe also a little bit disheartened to add yet another thing to the mix that our current modern lifestyle um, uh, uh, um, is having, you know, another part of the, of the effects we're having um, on, on nature. And what I like to try to say to people is that a lot of the things that we've already taken in about how to reduce that footprint, um, if we implement them in our lives, like shopping more locally for things that trying to have the things that we um, purchase be um, part uh, from from closer to us, um, trying to purchase less overall. Um, all of those changes in lifestyle um, can also help make it quieter out there. Ships that um, are working already to be greener operators in order to uh, increase their fuel efficiency and reduce the implications um, of their emissions on the atmosphere, those changes often have correlates in reducing their noise. So there are some of these changes we, we need to make as, as individuals um, and as part of um, large groups um, 
are holistic changes that will have um, benefits uh, across a, a bunch of the different features of our effects on the environment. And with that, I, I think we're going to turn it towards questions. Yes, yeah, so here's a list of additional resources. And um, for anyone who would like to get any of these audio files, you can contact Monica Allen at NOAA Communications. Her contact information is there. And with that, we will turn it over to questions. So just a reminder that only registered reporters may ask questions. So reporters, if you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A box that's separate from the chat box. Um, and my colleague Liza will ask it to, of the panel on your behalf. Um, please also remember to state your full name and affiliation when writing your question. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Liza, I don't know if there are any in the queue. If not, we can just give a minute for people to start typing in their questions. We can get right started with a question from Craig, Craig Miller from KQED. He asked, Chris, when you say you saw lots of calves, are you saying the decreased noise positively affected reproduction? Yeah, sorry, no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> that's the problem with the minute talk. <laughs> um, no, uh, the, the calves were conceived, you know, months or 10 months earlier, and then, you know, have, are already six months old. So that was already predetermined before the summer. It's just that coincidentally, this really quiet summer coincided with um, a kind of a baby boom after um, some pretty rough times for these humpback whales. Uh, the blob North Pacific marine heat wave in 2014 through 2016 um, caused a really sharp decline in the number of whales and a very sharp decline in the calving rate. So, um, uh, so this, you know, the quiet conditions was not related to the fact that there were calves, but it also was probably beneficial to those calves. Hope that answers your question. Next question is from Harvey Lifford, freelancer. In Grazer Bay, the slide you mentioned, in the slide you mentioned more calves this year. Due to less ship traffic, cyclical or what? If fewer ships, how does that work regarding mating habits? Right, okay. Yeah, so uh, Glacier Bay is a farm, so they're there to feed. And, um, you know, I mentioned that they were all spread out and they were in group. Well, I didn't say they were in groups, but they're like everywhere and there are a lot of calves and they're resting. Part of that, a lot of what whales do is really about their food. And um, so uh, it may not be because of the pandemic, you know, the, the lower traffic that we were seeing, um, you know, that kind of behavior. But it, again, it was probably beneficial to the whales to have that little quiet space. Thanks. Sorry, I was muted there. Justine Kalma asks, can you please explain how the hydrophones work? She's a science reporter at The Verge. Who wants to take oh, that one? <laughs> I, I could briefly answer. Uh, you know, essentially uh, uh, a hydrophone is an underwater microphone. So just here's my, you know, little changes in, in pressure that, which is sound underwater. That's, that's all there is to it. Tristan Barrick from the Times Picayune in New Orleans asked, any data or insights about whether there's been a reduction in noise in the Gulf of Mexico? Sure, I can take that. We deployed a recorder in the Gulf in uh, April. And so we're planning on go and pick it up uh, in the next month or so. So stay tuned for the answer to that. Can I just quickly chime in on that? Uh, sure, it's uh, Jason Gadamke again. Um, yeah, that's a particularly interesting question. It's one that we've certainly been focused on. And what I will say is we, we made some increase just about the activities at least. So not uh, necessarily the, the noise directly, but just the amount of activity that's taking place in the Gulf of Mexico. And one of the interesting pieces um, was, was uh, basically the idea that, you know, the activities that are taking place are, are also tied to external economic factors and things. So with the low pro prices of oil currently and so on, um, you know, we may have seen reductions in activity that may or may not have been tied to the pandemic. So I think as Leela pointed out really effectively in her talk there, um, you know, some of these changes, uh, they're, they're not just like a complete stopping of activity and they're impacted by a number of other different factors. Um, but, you know, as, as Anna said, I think, you know, once we recover some of these instruments, we should have more of, a, of an insight on how that actually translated into noise levels. 
Right. We had a request to try applying the seismic sounds again. And so we thought we'd take a moment to play that experiment. Yeah, Adi, do you want to go ahead and try to play that? Yes, let me know if you can hear it. Otherwise, I'll share um, the audio screen if that works. OK, so here it goes. So there, it was a, I think, initial air gun, and then it's about every 10 seconds you should be able to hear another one. I don't have very good headphones, so I'm, I'm struggling hearing that at this point. But I think we have, don't we have some recordings that we are sharing otherwise? So we can put that in and, and then if you listen to it, if anybody's interested, you can listen to it on your computers and just have good headphones and you will hear it. We will make those links available on the event page as well and we'll share that link with you in case you do not have it. Yes, we have audio files for all of these sounds that the panelists discussed, so we can send those to any reporters who want them. Our next question is from Megan Sever, a freelancer. You guys said this is preliminary data. Any idea when the first publications might come out and when these data will be analyzed and released? Um, I'll just start that. Um, the, the work that I mentioned from John Ryan um, is in the process of being published. Um, and I think um, sort of spring of this coming year is the current um, journal journal timeline. Uh, so that's some results from Monterey Bay. Again, that's a cabled hydrophone with data coming you know, through a cable to shore continuously. So that makes some things easier. Um, in terms of some of the comparisons um, nationally for Sank Sound, we're aiming for next summer for um, a lot of the uh, comparative work between baseline past years and through a really solid section of, of 2020. Um, and um, oh, I had another thought, the stress work. So a lot of what people want to know is, you know, partially about these changes in the soundscape, but um, the end, end meaning for marine life is, is often uh, where people are really headed. For some of the stress work I mentioned, they're looking to take quite a lot of samples through 2021 in order to have that um, subsequent year as part of their analytical period. So that's going to take some time to get through and, and will be um, a longer wait. I'm, I'm sure others have uh, trajectories as well. Yeah, I could mention that um, the Pacific Northwest results, preliminary results have been published um, by a lead author named uh, David Barkley out of Dalhousie University. And that was published in um, Journal of Acoustic Society of America. Uh, and that was the preliminary results just the few, first few months of 2020 through the spring. And then now we're, we're both working on a, a longer term paper that we hope to have out, we submit uh, in the next month or two. Uh, that'll look at uh, through the whole summer and fall in the Pacific Northwest. James, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. We're going to try. I was just going to quickly chime in. You know, I mentioned the, the collaboration with our international partners. Um, uh, you know, I just think in terms of the time frames, um, you know, as Leela and Bob mentioned, that some of the the more localized studies will be done earlier, ideally if they're on cable hydrophones, because that data comes back immediately, as Leela said. Um, but you know, some of the the broader work uh, with other countries and things like that, that will take a significant amount of time before any of that stuff will come out. You know, to give us more of the global picture of how uh, ocean soundscapes were impacted. Um, yeah, no, I'll just leave it at that for now. James Dacey, freelancer, asks, does acoustic pollution have an impact on smaller marine organisms? I, I can tackle that. Uh, there have been studies, yes, the answer is yes, but there, there has been a number of studies that show, for example, that fish larvae, which are very small, uh, use sounds from reefs to get back to them and to, to return basically to their, their uh, good habitat. And so they would be impacted by, by shipping noise. 
Also, the some of the sounds that I played from the flower garden banks are of snapping shrimp, and snapping shrimp are, are pretty small as well. So they use sound to um, capture prey. In essence, they're making these uh, snaps with their with their claw, hence their name. But they they rely on sounds to then um, potentially sense other cues in their environment, and so. It's, uh, th there's also been studies that show that uh, oysters or other uh, invertebrates can detect sounds. This is really, we're, we're still pretty early. There's been a lot more effort to understand the impact of sound on marine mammals and fish. But as we're starting to look at importance of sound on inverts, we are realizing that they are relying on it or using it in, in different ways. And so this is definitely a new area that we are exploring. I'll just, just jump in one. Go ahead. Okay, I just quickly on that. Um, yeah, look, I think that's actually a, a very important point. And, you know, Anna touched on it that there has been a lot of work on marine mammals, charismatic megafauna, as, as uh, is said. Um, but really, the, the impacts are, you know, across taxa. So, so you know, you do have uh, fish and vertebrates, crustaceans, and so on. Um, Leela, I just wonder if you want to mention uh, acoustic habitat. Would you like to, to just quickly mention that as well? Because I think the important thing here is really the idea that it's a much bigger picture issue than it is to just focus on how one particular sound may impact a whale or a dolphin or something along those lines. Sure. I think um, it's kind of a nice panel to do that on really quickly um, because so many of us are speaking about, you know, particular places in the ocean that have an imaginary line around them and that we have designated as special and to be protected. Um, and um, some of those mandates really say what we're supposed to do here is protect the fully function ecology of these places, all the living organisms in them. And that's where the functions of habitat and how it supports communities of animals and the interrelationships of sound that have not to do just with one marine mammal trying to speak to another marine mammal of its own kind, but the eavesdropping relationships of sound. Um, in terms of larvae using cues with particular places that sound different um, in order to choose um, a good settlement um, uh, habitat or a place that they can um, uh, uh, settle uh, and, um, and grow to their next life stage or um, animals eavesdropping in order to avoid predation or to detect prey. Um, so interrelationships um, between species that form the kind of fabric of animal life in a place. And increasingly what we've been trying to focus on at NOAA is to think about um, the influence of anthropogenically induced or you know, human, human changes in those places on that community function and, and how, um, how do we protect um, the status of those places. Barbara Moran from WBUR asks Lila, can you give some more specifics about how boat traffic changed in the Stillwagen Bank and how you have seen or measured any effects in marine life? Hi, Barbara. Um, we have been uh, looking really closely at the data actually just over the next, uh, the last couple of weeks to kind of get into, although we're seeing decreases in the spring and early summer overarchingly for Massachusetts Bay in how many vessels were detected using what I call the automatic identification system. We also have some evidence that much smaller traffic that does not, is not tracked by that pleasure boats, recreational ca uh, craft, folks out, social distancing on the water was increased. So we have a, an untracked increase in some vessel traffic parameters. We have a very obvious decrease in commercial whale watching, a decrease in cargo traffic and tankers and cruise ship, the big stuff coming through the traffic separation scheme in and out of the port of Boston. And yet we see this, um, if, if not um, a rise in, in pleasure boating, in yachting, um, and in some fishing traffic. And all of that is, is what I call the complicated mess that we're going to try to understand in terms of what it means to a feeding humpback whale. Um, does, are we going to be able to detect 
the, um, the importance of reducing background noise levels driven by that very large traffic that is indeed lower. What is, and does that make it a less stressful place to communicate while you're feeding and share information and keep contact with your calves? Do we see that in the vocal behavior? And or does having a lot of erratic new um, behavior by a lot of smaller vessel types um, add another stress function to a habitat um, is, is the unexpected, another whole stress parameter, which we know it is for mammals like me. You know, is that, is that another part of the pandemic um, that we need to understand for these offshore mammals? And so when we think the answer is yes for a place like Stellweg and then likely in several other coastal environments that have these kind of really uh, variable constellations of traffic. Justine Kalma from The Verge asks, can you expand on how humpback whales change their communication when there is a lot of noise? Yes, that's a great question. It's something that we really don't understand all that well. There are a handful of studies on humpbacks and a couple of other species that, can, that document that basically as the sound gets louder, the whale gets a little bit louder. Um, there are indications that that can only go on for so long. In other words, that that whale can't uh, vocalize infinitely loudly. So if the sound gets too loud, you know, they have to find another option. Um, some species have been documented to actually change their the frequency, the pitch of their sound uh, when they're trying to avoid a band, a frequency band when there's a lot of, where there's a lot of noise. And um, what we're thinking of looking at with this, my colleague Michelle Fournay at Sound Science, and, and she's also at Cornell University, um, what she has done is looked at the repertoire of humpback whales in Southeast Alaska. So I think she's documented maybe a dozen or so different types of, uh, of, of sounds that they make. The question is, um, what proportion of the time are they going to use those different sound types, maybe in a quiet environment? Some of them are actually more usable than they would be if the, the, um, if the environment was noisier. And just the whole, try to address the whole con a con a concept of complexity. In other words, if you or I are sitting in a room, we can have a pretty um, detailed and nuanced conversation here uh, together. But if we were talking across a busy street, we'd have to keep it real simple. So she's going to make a, a, you know, make some analyses that look at whether the complexity of the vocalizations changes in the quiet. So, anybody else want to add add to that thought? All right, Lauren Summer from NPR asks, is there any preliminary data about the noise reduction across all the acoustic monitoring stations this year? Um, I can jump in there because I think you're referring to maybe that last slide I showed with the, the large number of passive acoustic stations in US waters. Um, so the, the short answer is no, not from you know that whole range of instruments. There are primarily two different types of instruments that are shown there. Um, the vast majority of them are what are called archival instruments, which get put in the water and they are left there for anywhere from a few months to a couple of years. Um, but the, the, the issue with those is that you have to actually recover those instruments to get the data. So many of them have been in the water through the pandemic, um, but have not yet been recovered. Once we recover those instruments, we will be able to, um, to, uh, to look at the data, to see what the impacts on the, the soundscapes were, um, as well as do comparisons among regions. Now, some of the early stuff has come out and you heard each of these guys talk about some of the work that they in particular are involved in, um, but that sort of more comprehensive view is gonna take a lot more time uh, to, to get a real sense of. And we're gonna go ahead and stay on for a couple more minutes so we can get through all the open questions. Jenny Stiletovich from WR, WLRN asks, you mentioned that ocean noise has changed over the last couple hundred years. Can you talk a little about how shipping traffic has changed ocean noise? Do you have studies showing changes in levels? How would you characterize it? Like a rock concert compared to an acoustic performance? There's a lot to unpack there. I'll start and then I know 
I know Bob and Jason can help me out. So there are um, the, the tracking of uh, commercial vessel traffic in direct relationship to standardized measurements over, the, um, over that real growth period of industrialization post the 1940s. The only places in the world where that has been possible using uh, some US Navy assets that were in place um, and then compared in a, in, in, a, in a standardized way to some later deployments has been in the central Eastern Pacific. Um, so there, um, in those places, there has been um, a close relationship between um, that growth in shipping and um, low frequency sound levels that match the, the, the peak sounds coming off of propellers when they cavitate. And that is when the bubbles on those propellers burst and they produce a signature. That is what we've been talking about as, as vessel noise. That is that, that bursting bubble is, is, is a large portion of that, in, that noise, um, uh, radiated noise signature. So there we in in uh, noise every 10 years. But, and here's where the fun, tricky parts come into acoustics, that doubling is three decibels in a logarithmic scale that is the decibel scale of a, of a way of measuring intensity. And just to make it even more fun, and when we try to relate that to your experiences in, as an in-air mammal, that is a different decibel scale. So we have to do some comps, uh, some some re-referencing of um, of what the sound levels are for doubling of sound in air as we experience it in the human ear, relative to what goes on underwater when we double the amount of acoustic energy in a band over a 10-year time period correlated with the growth of commercial traffic between 1950 and 60, 60 and 70, 70 and 80, and beyond. So what we've been building since this 2015 period has been to try to address the lack of spatial coverage of our long-term trend assessment for acoustics and to be able to correlate it with traffic patterns. Um, a lot of what you're seeing here are some of the first things that have tried to take a stab at that spatial need and, and fill, that, fill that missing gap. And anything that Jason or Bob want to add or anyone else, please do. Well, that's great, uh, Leela. Um, yeah, I just would add that it's that's a great point about um, uh, container shipping has increased since the 50s and gross tonnage as world economies have grown. So that's what's thought as driving the, the, meat, uh, the big force behind increased ocean noise. But it's, you know, it's, it's very spatially dependent. You know, the closer you are to ports and ship traffic lanes, those are the noisy areas in the deep ocean and or we work in the around the Southern Ocean or the Mariana Trench, so it's very quiet. So it's it's kind of relatively speaking, you know, where these changes are observed. And I'll just quickly jump in on this because um, I think this is a great question. And and what it does is it really again highlights the need for systems like we've talked about today. Um, you know, there is some uh, work I, I think Leela was just mentioning from recorders that and, and recording sites that have had instruments for you know, about the ha last half century or, or so, but they are exceptionally rare. So we don't really have a good window into what sound levels were, white, were like uh, 40, 50 years ago and so on. Um, and again, this is why I'm, I'm raising this because I do think this is a really important point that it, it highlights how important it is to have these long-term ocean observation systems in place and continuing on. So you know, we started the noise reference station network within the last number of years. Uh, the, the Sang Sound project and so on are critical to understanding how the ocean soundscape is changing due to anthropogenic impacts. But it's also essential that these systems are in place now for the foreseeable future, because that will really, in particular with the pandemic, it will allow us to look at a good long period before the pandemic. It will allow us to look at you know, the changes in the ocean soundscapes during the pandemic. And then if we maintain these systems um, for years onward, uh, it will then allow us to compare it to the post-pandemic period. So again, just highlighting the importance here of these long-term ocean observation systems. All right, Darna Noor from Gizmodo's Climate Science Earther asks a very basic question, but could you all just explain some positive impacts you've seen on different creatures due to the quiet of COVID-19, besides whales being able to roam freely, impact on mating in some species, 
on ability to find food, et cetera. I know it's preliminary data, but would love to know any specific examples you've observed. I think we're only quiet because um, uh, those are all the things we're looking for, but they actually are the most complicated. And so um, in order to know that something's changed, you have to have a very good understanding of its baseline and its baseline is never simple. Its baseline is naturally quite variable. So a lot of what we've been, I know we're harping on this point, it's gonna get dull, but a lot of what we're looking at is characterizing uh, what does it look like in a more affected time in order to be able to really understand whether animals have been freed up. I have seen some good um, you know, anecdotal studies and people are, are, are very open about saying that they are, um, that they come through the human lens of being at the surface, looking at dolphins that seem to be more in an area of a lot of um, what has usually typically been a lot of ferry traffic near Hong Kong. And now they're seeing quite a lot of dolphin activity in a place that doesn't have a whole lot of, of ferry traffic. So um, I've seen a, some coverage in the media of some of these you know, little moments in time. And um, I, I call what Chris has been talking about way beyond anecdotal because that is one of the you know, most detailedly observed populations of marine animals on the planet. And so um, her, her first thoughts about what she's seeing are pretty darn grounded in what the past has looked like um, uh, um, in, in when looked at in a standardized way. But unfortunately, a lot to really put this together and paint a picture of whether animals are, are, are finding more mates, uh, feeding more efficiently, um, um, uh, and, and in ways that speak to the scale of the patterns that the pandemic has produced which sometimes are meaningful to animals in a very small area, if that's their residency, and others times uh, an, a full ocean basin, which is the roaming area and foraging habitat of a fin whale. Um, all those scales are all relevant here for pandemic changes, and it'll take us some time to, to look at those behaviors at those scales. And if I can add to that, one of the other challenges with the pandemic has been that it has actually been very hard for all of us to go out to see and do these kinds, because most of what you are asking, often we would do that with behavioral studies or being out in the water. It is hard to infer a lot of that information simply from acoustics, or it helps to have visual confirmations of things. And uh, there's been very, very little field work that has happened over the last eight or 10 months because of the pandemic. I'll go ahead and jump in just one more time. Um, the, uh, I, I think just one really good example of the type of work that we could see coming out. And again, this is not, as these guys just said, this is not specific to, to necessarily what's been done during the pandemic yet. But a number of years ago, there was a, a, an absolutely fascinating study that was uh, carried out um, in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Um, and what occurred there, and, and please, if any, if I get this, the details of this wrong, please other panelists jump in and correct me here, but there was a dramatic reduction in vessel traffic um, after the 9-11 attacks. And there was a study that was done that looked at the stress hormones in, I believe, North Atlantic right whales um, from during the the period of reduced activity and compared it to periods when there was not that reduced activity. So presumably the animals were exposed to less noise during those periods of time when there was less vessel activity. And what they found was that they actually had decreased uh, stress hormones or, or decreased indications of stress from the hormone work. And it was really a, a, an absolutely fascinating piece of work. And hopefully we will eventually get, you know, some results like uh, at least testing those same kind of questions um, in, in response to the pandemic. Freelancer Harvey Leifert asks, do you have any comments on the US Navy sonar impact or other navies? I think the only comment here would be that, um, you know, the scale of what we're looking at in terms of what is most affected, um, what has uh, been most affected by, um, uh, by human activity changes 
um, what the most the most affected human activity changes. Um, the the Navy is not the to the top of that list. A lot of recreational and commercial activities um, that are operating at at really wide ranging scales that have been highlighted here um, tend to be some of the most dominant influences over long periods of time. And I say all those words carefully because. The Navy's um, activities can have uh, strong peak introductions of sound during exercises and testing and training activities for sure. And that's part of the constellation of, of work that we do with the Navy. Um, but in the context of this type of work, um, that would be the proverbial drop in the bucket. And just uh, just quickly following up with that, I'm just going to mention two terms, which is really, I think, uh, exactly what Lila was getting at, um, acute and chronic. And what we are focusing mostly on here today is chronic noise. So things like uh, propeller cavitation leading to large amounts of vessel noise, uh, seismic surveys and things like that, which take place over long periods of time. These are chronic noise sources that impact, you know, an ecosystem over longer periods of time. Um, you also have acute uh, sources of noise, which is generally what something like sonars would fall into, where they may have a, a, a short term, they may be very intense sounds over a short period of time that could lead to uh, behavioral changes, for example, in individual animals and so on. Uh, but again, that's not really what we've been focusing on here today. Our, our uh, interest in this uh, pandemic and so on really has more to do with assessing the impacts of chronic noise. Donna Noir from Gizmodo follows up. Are there any existing proposals for policies or regulation that could reduce sound from shipping or industry? What step can governments or industry take? And similarly, Justine Kalma asks, what could, what can or should be done to reduce noise levels when economic activity returns to normal? I'll start. And I'll hand it over. So the, the U.S. actually um, uh, led the way, combination of representatives from NOAA and the U.S. Coast Guard, um, to bring this issue to the International Maritime Organization, which is part of the U.N. and is the international regulatory authority for ships. Um, in that, to that body, we brought a proposal in 2008 um, to to make quieting of commercial vessels part of the IMO's agenda. Uh, we worked on it with party uh, countries um, until 2014, and the, at that point, the, they passed an, uh, voluntary guidelines um, that would uh, set out processes for building and operating vessels um, uh, that are quieter um, for these large commercial operations. In 2016, uh, Canada took the helm of that effort. For first, more uh, uh, first, really finding that the voluntary efforts were not going far enough, that they weren't being ingested into build plans um, quickly enough. Uh, ships, when they are built, have 45-year time horizons. So a lot of the work that you're familiar with for changing over um, things in transportation to make them more environmentally benign in in, in air traffic, in cars, and trucks. We always think about having to phase out older technology and bring on new, right? And how do we build policies that allows for that? In ships, it's even longer time horizons. So we have to figure out how to do this at over even longer time horizons. And Canada has been really promoting that over the past several years. And right now in cooperation between Australia, the US and Canada, we're bringing another proposal to the IMO to see if we can get that body to re-agenda its noise and have uh, more discussions in parallel with the work they're doing right now, which is very um, intense on, on making commercial shipping more energy efficient and reducing emissions. So those two big pushes, because they have similar technological implications to what we need for noise in terms of propeller designs that are more efficient, in terms of hull and propeller matching that makes a more streamlined operation in the water, there are a lot of noise gains to be had in this holistic greening of commercial traffic. Um, and that's what we're hoping to uh, continue to promote in these international in these international bodies. There have been several other types of efforts, and there are that are in direct relationship with individual companies. Maersk has been looking at what the noise implications are, or some of the big changes they've made in uh, container ships off California, and found that by making them more energy efficient, they also made them quieter. 
So there have been some company-based efforts um, and against, again, a very large international effort um, and a bunch of work and, um, and capacity building by Canada in the last several years. Um, and uh, in particular around the port of Vancouver to try to incentivize uh, ships um, coming in and out of that port to be quieter um, and, uh, yeah, and work with industry on, 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 on moving that forward. Yeah, that's okay. great stuff, Leela. Um, thank you. I just wanted to add a couple of the measures that we've taken in Glacier Bay that, that do help to reduce um, underwater noise are to uh, have the vessels go slower. We made a, we, we um, have vessel regulations to prevent ship strikes, but also uh, to reduce underwater noise. And we have made measurements that show that that actually works for almost every class of vessel. And um, again, as Leela said, there's value added because the vessels are actually more, most of them are more efficient at that slower speed. Thanks. We can actually, you can also do things like tra managing traffic and having traffic come in, you know, all together rather than having a continuous noise footprint kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, segregated in time so that there are quiet periods and noise. Great. So um, it looks like those are all the open questions we had, but um, we are still going to go over to that informal discussion room over Zoom if anyone wants to stick around, if they have any more questions or just have a quick chat with the panelists. Um, that way you'll be able to speak directly with them um, and chat. So the link to the discussion room is in the chat box. The passcode is AGU press, all lowercase, one word. Um, so you guys can go ahead and click on that and switch over and we'll end this formal presentation. Thank you so much panelists. This was really interesting and uh, we'll see you in the discussion room in a few minutes.